I'm Katie Holden, and I've worked in a variety of product and technology leadership roles at startups and larger companies like Workday. I've always been a technology enthusiast and perpetual learner. Then I pair that with a really strong desire to actually apply the technology in service of our customers and business impact. My current role is leading our user experience platforms. It's a global team of about 300 people, and we deliver the engine that powers the entire Workday product suite across all of Workday's applications in HR and finance. We're also a scale team. We process many hundreds of millions of user sessions and a couple billion page loads each month. We're responsible for baking in artificial intelligence innovations across the entire Workday user experience. Because at the end of the day, Workday is an enterprise suite for our customers, and they need efficiencies from artificial intelligence everywhere in their business. So this is what you'll learn today, how I've been thinking about AI supercharged user experiences and how you can do the same in your own organization. User experience really matters. In fact, it's a major factor in many companies' choice to purchase software. Workday did research with hundreds of customers looking at the drivers for their final purchase decision, and the number two item was easy-to-use software. Easy-to-use software means that employees are fast and efficient at whatever they're trying to do. It means that they have more time to do their most strategic work. And with 65 million users under contract and more than 10,500 organizations around the world, we really need to design and deliver AI experiences knowing that there are different needs for different user types. And for business leaders, trying to serve a vast landscape of applications and user types, it can be paralyzing to know where to start. So I'm gonna offer you the playbook that I've been using to solve this problem. First part of the playbook is to deeply know the different users or personas that you're serving and their jobs to be done. Personas are created to represent a user type that might use a website, a brand, or a product in a similar way. So for example, persona types share things like key characteristics, their needs, their goals, behaviors, pain points. These personas are typically produced by a user research team where they interview real people and then they back up and create an abstraction that can be useful to keep in mind when building products. I used to work in the learning space and some examples of personas for that company were university students, and medical professors. Once you have the personas, we add in jobs to be done. They're a second design concept that I've used at basically every organization I've worked at. Jobs to be done articulate the breadth of user types and really what are they trying to do with your system? I mean, just think about it. A frontline worker working at a retail store in New York City, they're gonna need a very different type of user experience than say, a recruiting professional who's trying to assess hundreds of nursing applicants for their busy hospital in Barcelona, right? So the combination of having personas and jobs to be done are those two key foundations to really understand your users and frankly, the best opportunities to have AI impact. So once you have the personas and the jobs to be done, the next part of the playbook is to look for those opportunities to have a scaled impact. Scaled impact is where one AI investment can actually improve the experience for many or all of the personas we just talked about. A great example of this is what Workday is doing with our search and our chatbot experiences. The innovation of large language models or LLMs is that we now have this incredible technology that actually understands human language as an input. Gone are the days where we have to have users keyword search and have an exact match for a complex HR term. For example, let's say you're a hiring manager at a retail store in New York City. You really should just be able to ask Workday using your own language something like, help me staff my store. And then we can automatically direct you to the create job requisition task. I mean, think about it, create job requisition. No one remembers those words. But it's really not just about creating job requisitions. It turns out from our research that the vast majority of people managers who use Workday they don't know specific HR and finance terminology, but they really do need to use our systems to do important work, like looking at their team's time and absence, growing and nurturing their careers, and things like compensating them fairly. So coming back to AI investments, this one AI investment, upgrading our search and our chat experiences with AI and LLMs, basically adds a natural language understanding, and that improves findability for all persona types. To return to my previous example, the retail employee, they can find their pay detail much easier. 
And the recruiter, they can staff their stores faster. Some AI ideas sound really good on paper, but you still need to engage with users and customers to validate and make sure they're valuable. Let's talk about a common trap that comes with technology innovation. When one good example comes out in the industry, people often pattern match to figure out where else can we use it. And pattern matching is a very reasonable mindset for enterprise leaders who are thinking about applying AI innovation at scale. But it is not a shortcut to doing the more detailed analysis to ensure that the value persists for your use case or industry. The classic example that we've seen play out numerous times now is content generation. Content generation is where a large language model can automatically generate a body of content based on a user prompt. For example, you could ask it, write me a poem in the Shakespearean style about a potted plant. <laughs> and I'll tell you, it is astounding watching that poem get scribed before your very eyes by a large language model in seconds. The time savings and the efficiency are very compelling. But does that mean that content generation is always going to yield efficiencies and benefits? After all, it's always faster to never start from scratch. Of course, I've clearly led the witness here. The answer is no. Content generation is not always correct, even if there are efficiency gains. In fact, every use case has its nuances. And at Workday, in partnership with our responsible AI team, we have a series of frameworks we use to validate that the benefit is clear, the risk is within reason, and the user experience is there to support it. Let me give you two examples where Workday has considered using AI and content generation, but ultimately decided not to. So first, let's talk about job descriptions. It's a huge time savings for people managers and recruiting professionals to never have to start from scratch. Workday has 10,000 text editors across our product suite that theoretically could have AI auto-generate content for the user. So another area that we explored was offer letters. It sounds very promising, right? It's yet another way to make the recruiter's life more efficient. Alas, when engaging with our customers, they shared a key insight. Unlike a job description, an offer letter is actually a legally binding document. Every single word choice matters. For legally binding accuracy around employment laws, local market considerations, the pay terms, that's not necessarily the kind of thing you want AI to auto-generate for you. In fact, our customers carefully curate and manage a small set of templates. They're guarded for changes to only be made by the legal team, not the people manager. So the point is this use case sounded very compelling on the surface using pattern matching. And even though it's technologically feasible to do so quickly, there are better uses of the technology that we could focus on first. So a second example where we explored content generation, but ultimately decided not to pursue it further, is using AI for an employee's growth plan. We originally started with the idea that generative AI could give managers a first draft of an employee's growth plan. But it turns out customer feedback led us to learn that they really want employees in the driver's seat of managing their growth. They don't want AI creating something too quickly. It's meant to be a thoughtful process on the employee's part. So in this case, slow is a feature, not a bug. And the customer feedback is what helped us evolve our thinking to actually have AI help with conversation starters instead. Because it turns out AI is brilliant at reviewing the plan that an employee wrote and then creating suggestions for conversations between the manager and the employee. And so in this case, AI is actually helping managers have a more meaningful and personalized career conversation. When people think about AI, they often jump to the holy grail, which is the idea of AI automation. Let's step back and define this. AI automation is the idea that a new technology can be fed sufficient business context and data and application access, and then autonomously complete a task instead of the human. Full AI automation is a high bar. And honestly, until we have another step change in AI capability, it's generally not feasible with the latest models. Experts who are optimists predict it might come in the next few years. But experts who are pessimists predict it might be closer to a decade. But either way, we're really not there today. But maybe more importantly, 
not everything should be automated. Having a human in the loop is an important concept for many use cases at this stage. Human in the loop means that a person is part of the review step for any AI automation that takes place. So let me start by just looking at a few examples out in the landscape today. When I'm using my personal email tool, I can easily generate an email draft in a few clicks. But I do always read it and maybe tweak it before I send. I mean, just imagine how hollow the world would be if I told AI, hey, send my mom a happy birthday note. And then it wrote it, and without me even seeing it, just sent it to her. Okay, that might be AI automation, but it's not the world that I want to live in. We want AI to automate the mundane parts of the work, like creating my first email draft. But I don't want it to remove the humanity, where in this case it might be me making sure that my birthday note has that one line in it that is going to crack my mom up when she reads it. So the key to being an organizational leader in the area of AI is to identify and design for patterns where having a human in the loop appears in the moments that matter most. Let me give you an example of a recent feature we're working on at Workday. One of our user experience initiatives helps assist managers to make more rigorous and fair compensation decisions. So imagine you have a manager in your organization who's going to give a one-time bonus to an employee. Okay, yes, the AI can help them quickly find the task, do a first draft pre-fill of the information. But really at that point, we intentionally design for an explicit AI plus human co-creation user experience. That experience encourages the manager to ask questions. In fact, they can use data from Workday to inform their choice, like, who else on my team got a bonus recently? What was the amount? Using that data and co-creating with AI creates a better outcome overall. And of course, we always want the manager in control to click Submit when they're finished. One way that you can help encourage human-in-the-loop design thinking in your own organizations is to bake it into your design systems and your templates that are used by the product teams working on AI features. That way, we can make it a scalable pattern and ensure that the best practice is the one used by default. There are many hundreds of companies who know how to build great user experiences. It requires planning, iteration, using data, and working very closely with designers. Because of this, there's playbooks out in the industry for companies of every size. But there are not playbooks for AI and user experience. The playbooks are being written as we speak. The old playbooks don't work, but why is that? AI development is not like typical software development. Typical software development is more or less a linear process. Commonly, there's a discovery phase, delivery phase, where the product teams compare. They have product managers, designers, researchers, and engineers who are following a semi-structured process to scope and deliver a feature. And many teams have this process down to a science because it's something they run every week or month or quarter. So now let me explain how AI software development is different. And when I do this, I'll share three practical tips for how you can build AI into your own user experiences. Let's start with tip number one. AI feature development is actually much closer to art than science. So it's critical that you leave time for experimentation early in the product development lifecycle. It's still unclear what AI is actually capable of. Some things AI is astonishingly good at, like writing a first draft of text based on a prompt. From poetry to screenplays to email drafts, Almost everyone has had a magical AI moment watching something live authored before their very eyes. On the other hand, there are some things that AI was astonishingly bad at. Famously, many of the earlier AI models were astonishingly bad at precision answers or even basic arithmetic. Hallucinations, which is where AI confidently states a fact that is completely made up with no actual underlying source data, they were just comical to watch in the industry. So this leads us to the second tip, which is that it's critical to engage with real end users and real data to assess AI's efficacy. Again, in the typical software development process, you have a product manager and a designer. They're usually using design tools to create mockups of features that they're gonna show to a customer or a user. The mockups are a generic abstraction of what a typical customer might look like. And we have this at Workday. For example, our designers create mock-ups for a fake company called Global Modern Services, 
where we have a mock organizational chart, mock job descriptions, mock employee data, things like expense reports or calibration data, and more. And we show customers features using this mock data. And from that, they're often able to pattern match with us for how a feature would or wouldn't work well with their own Workday implementation. That is not the case with AI features. We have seen time and time again that producing a great looking demo on mock data simply doesn't hold up when you release it with real data in the wild. Building AI features not only requires experimentation much earlier in the process, but it also requires access to real data sets much earlier in the process. Now, typically, product teams can be hesitant to launch something to customers until it's relatively polished. There's an industry value or idea that we should build the minimum viable or lovable product, and that's the standard that you need to reach before release. But frankly, that mentality is wasted time with AI products because the AI quality and the efficacy can really only be assessed once it has access to real data. So teams should actually be accelerating their ability to try AI with early adopter customers, including setting customer expectations that, you know what, the feature completeness, the user experience, they might be a little bit raw, but it's because you're doing those early iterations while you understand the AI's efficacy first. Let me give you a concrete example. Right now, a lot of those virtual meeting tools out in the industry are providing AI summaries. It's such a powerful idea. Let's say you miss a meeting. Well, why not just skim the AI recap versus watching the entire meeting recording? But in practice, here's my personal experience. The AI recaps are okay, but they often get the facts and the action items wrong. The AI recaps of the general discussion are quite accurate and good, but the specifics, mm, you can't really trust them. This is a great example of where launching something like that early getting real data and iterating on the value first can have a big impact because it would have been a total waste of time for those video teams to build out lots of features focused on things like action items, given that the AI really might not be ready for that. And so this brings us to tip number three. As leaders, you need to prepare your teams to throw away or stop many of the experiments that just didn't work out. While AI and user experience can appear magical, there inevitably are going to be many places that it's just not ready for prime time yet. And as a leader, we need to change how we incentivize and motivate our teams. We want to motivate their speed of learning, their speed of iteration. And a stopped feature is not the team's fault. It's actually learning to celebrate and then incorporate that learning into the next set of AI features that you go after. There's a lot of content out there about creating a culture that celebrates failures and learning, and that ethos couldn't be more important in the age of AI, because there's very little proven ground. And the winning companies are going to be the ones that have the fastest teams to iterate, adopt, and adapt. So in conclusion, we covered four key sections. First, how to have a scaled impact by applying AI to many different persona types. Second, Vetting each of your use cases for value in your business context versus relying on pattern matching. Third, why human in the loop is a critical user experience principle in the AI era. And last but not least, we had three practical tips for how you can build AI into your own user experiences. Thank you so much for joining me. I hope you learned how I've been thinking about AI supercharged user experiences and how you might do the same in your own organization. Thank you.